Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our next major milestone is 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 75 Patreon supporters away from achieving this goal and getting ever more closer to our overall goal of starting a nonprofit. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all weekend warriors will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. And we have a special announcement. We have a new sponsor of the Patreon program, Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll receive 10% off your orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community. You'll be in the running for weekly Patreon giveaways, our monthly photo contest that we do every single month, and of course, members only content and so much more. If you would like to help Fishing the DMV grow bigger and better every single month to be part of a fantastic community that represents Virginia, Maryland, and the surrounding area, please check out the link down below. Thank you so much. Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. We're getting there slowly. Once we get some yep. actually stable weather conditions. Actually, let's go. Uh, and three two one okay and we will be live right now okay perfect so now we can continue our conversation this is a good conversation to actually have on air so um yeah it's just like the weather's just got to change here uh it's it's insane how much rain we got uh in such a short period of time it completely blew yeah, everything out yeah we got a lot it was uh um both rivers got a lot of rain a lot of water um and because the water's warmer it doesn't feel, I mean, it would go out and it's 49, but since it's warmer, um, that water doesn't clear up as fast in the river. No. If this was January or February, that water would have cleared up by now, by the time it got down below uh, 10 feet, you know, in the gauge, it would have been a lot clearer. Is that because it just doesn't have as much rain in the system? No, just because the water temperature, the warmer the water, the, the more, for whatever reason, I don't know the scientific reason, but for whatever reason, um, the warmer the water the um the more it holds the um uh, sediment in um in suspension and you know in, in the water column hmm that's have you ever noticed that no that's a I, I i am now that you said it now that you mentioned it i'm actually thinking yeah huh yeah that's really and cool and then um you can have a real defined uh clear and dirty line coming down the river you know in the winter time in cold water when do you think that switch happens is it really like february march I think sometime in March, um, you know, like late March and now, uh, I think this is a hard time to fish this time of year it can be hard because, um, they're transitioning to, uh, you know, to spawn. They're going to not yet, but they will on the upper Potomac. What is the spawn? Like, when is that time period? Is it like April, June, July? Like what time is it early? May. May sometime in May uh, is usually the generic time May 1st to like the first or second week of June. And um, it just depends on uh, when the water is going to reach over 60 degrees just because it hits 60 degrees on a Saturday for the very first time. Doesn't mean they're going to start spawning. They have to, uh, they, they know that that water is never going to go down below 60 degrees again. Once they know that that's when they start spawning. Mm, that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I know we're going to get ahead of ourselves there with that, but let's keep going. Um, when it, when they start spawning, like what, what clues you into it besides just the weather? Is it like you start seeing bloody tails? Do you see them make beds or, or what? No, you start finding uh, that, that time of year, you start finding um, heavy concentrations of fish in, in, you know, in areas where you think they're going to spawn, which is going to be on the Potomac, which is rocky areas. That's the whole river's rocky, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but rocky uh, ledge systems and stuff, you know, that, that dominate that part of the river. Do they look for slack water to spawn or will they spawn in current? No, they're looking for slack water, but slack water that's in current, you know, meaning like um, if they have a few feet of water, I don't know, let's say like three feet of water, two feet, two, three feet of water. And um, they have some, like a current break, a rock, uh, preferably a rock, I would imagine. Um, cause that's how I, I, um, see most of them spawning. Um, as long as they can sit behind that and hide, it doesn't matter how high the water is. 
mm. because it's it's a even if that rock goes underwater three feet, there's still a um, eddy down below underwater eddy blocking those um, that bed of, that they that they've made with the eggs and stuff. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And then um, and then they'll they'll you know they'll they'll um, they'll spawn behind uh, hmm. off uh, um, you know islands, points, stuff like that. What kind of concentration will they get during the spawn? Is it three or four? Is it just a bunch of lone fish? They stack up like in the winter? No, they just it's dozens of fish in certain areas. There's one behind every rock, or I should say two behind every rock. You know, if then and, and you, you can see them too. You can see so, some if the water gets clear enough, you know, and um and you're kind of just cruising around certain areas and you yeah. look down. You'll see the fish too. You'll see them swimming around, and they look agitated when they're swimming. Hmm. I don't know how to explain their what 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 I mean by agitated, but they they just they look like they just want to um, attack something. You know, we'll get there soon enough. Uh, it's I don't know. Like May feels like so far away, even though it's like we're in the beginning of April now. Thinking of May is just like a distant thought, uh, especially the the weather right now is so freaking bipolar. It it was raining and it's snowing, then the damn sun gets blotted out by the moon. It's raining cats and dogs. No, I, don't, I don't like um, I don't like April. Um, I think April's very unstable. I think March is unstable, and I think February is. I think those three months of the year seem to be real unstable with the, with the weather, but in April, it, it's supposed to rain in April, right? I mean, that's what it, it rains in April and then everything grows in May, right? Exactly. And it's kind of how it is. And it, and it definitely, in your case, being a, a river guy, I a hundred percent understand that versus like, if you're like, if you like fishing lakes at all, April's fantastic. You know, they get onto the beds, they're, they're staging up to go back in pockets. It's great. But when you're dealing with like the Potomac, the Shenandoah, the Susquehanna, even, you know, that stuff is, it's frustrating. Um, right now, the past couple of weeks, what has the water been like on the upper Potomac? Like, what is the gauge been at, generally speaking? Well, right now, it's it's up. Um, let's see here real quick. Yeah. I don't want to misspeak or oh. miss, yeah, misspeak here. And get canceled. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get uh, canceled in the world of fishing. Um, It'll be. Bye. Not being accurate. It'd be hashtag so got, cancel Jeff and then hashtag for Ukraine. Yeah. Well, right now it's eight four. It's going to level off. Eight four. Now I'm looking at the Edwards Ferry gauge. So for everyone else other than me, let's go upstream. So we're at Point of Rocks right now. Uh, it's five seven at Point of Rocks five seven nine, and it looks like it's going to level off. And uh, it's estimated right now to uh, to level off and stay stay uh looks like it's going to go back up above five right now it's claiming but that's just an estimation you see on the on the graph have you ever you ever look at these um these um water level gauges Wh which one do you pull up right now pull up the uh point of uh, the water gauge of point of rocks there, there's two different ones right now um let me see here can i uh course i can't do that well, why would i be able to on this computer guys we'll have a link to jeff's gofundme so we can get him a proper computer too uh well i have i have a real nice computer uh, i have uh, one of those apple studio computers for uh videos and stuff fancy yeah it's a super nice one yeah so that one right there um that's the new one right go, go down scroll down uh -uh. keep scrolling is it does it ask you um for uh yeah yeah that that one right there that you pulled that up on the computer i've never seen it on the computer i've only ever seen it on my phone that one right there's the the newer one the one that i'm trying to send you right now is let's see here is it the weather how service come me, how come it won't let me copy it's a national weather service here it is. Uh, yeah that one right there so I, I think I've told this to people before, and I've tried to explain it to them on, on here. So you see um, you see the blue line, mm -hmm. that dark blue line? That's what's happening right now. That's what's happened and what is going, what is happening. See the uh, purple dots in the straight line, dot, straight line, dot? Yeah. That's estimation. That That's ah. not, uh, that's uh, the computer 
believing this is what's going to happen. That's going to change. But what will happen is when it does change, the blue line and that purple dot that's bumping up to that blue line, it'll separate and it'll be um, open. And that's that's when you know that the gauge is going to change. It's on par for doing what it says it's going to do right now. What are you looking for? Like, what would be perfect for, for in Jeff's world, what would be perfect? Like during the spawn? Just right now, like, what would you like to see? It to stay where it's at right now. At five? Yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, that's, that's pretty, that's, that's good water. Cause, cause uh, it's five, seven there. When you go to Edwards Ferry, it's, it's over eight. And that's the one I've always gone off of. So they're always about the same. Um, if it's eight, four, it's probably five, seven at um, Point of Rocks, always. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain situations and occasions where the gauges might be different, but uh, those are few and far between. But um, yeah, about, about this water level, because you can get around pretty much anywhere. What happened? You, you can get around. You can get around anywhere. When would you consider it blowout then? Would it be at, at 11, 10 when you double it? Like, well, no, that's just you, you see where it says it shows a yellow, it's action. Um, it, it just depends on how, um, uh, and anytime it goes up and it goes up well over a foot, like immediately, you know, it'll, it'll just go straight up. Um, a blow would be like, uh, probably somewhere around 15 where it came from you see where it was at 15 and a half 16 when it's that high do the fish bite at all or do they just completely shut down no they will but there's so um only certain situations when um i feel like it's uh you're able to do that and see so you have to be careful too because you can go out there at real high water levels um above 11 where it says the action you can go out there, but um, you have to make sure that the river's already crested. If the river hasn't crested, the um, you're gonna you're gonna see debris in the river, and you can't run out there if there's debris. There's trees coming down the river and stuff. It's dangerous. Mm. But once it crests and you give it another 24 hours or so, you should be uh, it should be clear sailing on the river. That's and at that stuff. level, you're not gonna hit anything. You can run the shorelines with a jet boat at that level. So. For people that are, are listening on Apple or Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever, at 5.7 feet, right around five feet of flow, that is a good place where you can take your jet boat out and not worry too much. And then I'm assuming a summertime level would be about like two, three feet. Yeah, so uh, back downstream at Edwards Ferry, a uh, operating level would be somewhere, um, I think. I think a good a good operating level will be somewhere around four feet, which okay. is probably somewhere um, just above two at uh, Point of Rocks. Hmm. But but then you have to, uh, th that's why, uh, then you realize why you're running a jet at that time. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there are rocks that you have to uh, watch out for. What do you think about this weather where last fall, late summer, fall into the winter, it was so dry that there was forest fires everywhere. You could barely, you could walk across parts of the river. And now it's like act of God type of raining. Is this, is this kind of normal or does this seem like. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's, a, it's uh we're coming up on spring. Yeah. I mean, um, if you look back historically, the water's got somewhere in the early 1900s. I forget where I found, I found it one day messing around on this site and um, you can get historical, uh, uh, measurements from the river and somewhere in the early 1900s the river at point of rocks read 0.33 feet <laughs> Jeez. not even a foot that's insane it goes on it, it, we've seen it this year we saw last year we saw it go under a foot i think it was like 0.99 or something like that and it um at uh edwards ferry that means it's going under three that's real low but yeah, I mean, it, it just does this, man. This is this is normal. That's the that's the challenge of fishing a uh, river system like this. Um, you know, like the Lower Potomac doesn't. They don't. Um, I wouldn't imagine they uh, 
are um, really affected by that because the tide comes and goes. Maybe the yeah. low tide's a lot lower. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I don't think so because they have they have it ma- charted to tell you what the lowest um, low tide is. Well, you also got like blowout tides too. But but your point is, you know, well-founded that like it's usually not that big a deal. Every oh, now and then um, it'll be. Yeah, it's very uh, – uh, the, the water changes on, on a river system like the Potomac or – or uh, the Shenandoah or the, I shouldn't say the Shenandoah, I don't even fish the Shenandoah. The Susquehanna fishes, they, um, the uh, water level changes so much. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible how much it changes. And the only thing that um, we're, we're at the mercy of uh, uh, the weather. I mean, sometimes you don't want it to rain. Sometimes you do, you know. And this might be something that you can speak to. Maybe it's not. What is the Susquehanna uh, flow rates like? What What do you like to see there? Does it matter as much? Oh, um, at um, what do I like to see it uh, on the Susquehanna? Yeah, I like to see it uh, read right around five feet in Duncannon. In Duncannon. Mm-hmm. Right around five feet. So here, let me pull up. Uh, let me pull up the old trusty uh, gauge that I've gone off of it's at eight two right now in the Susquehanna and Harrisburg. Um, that's high. It's probably still, um, the water's probably still pretty dirty, but, uh, yeah. Um, anything five or above, I, I think it's uh, comfortable to, um, you know, navigate the river in. I think that's important to know, especially with a lot of the kayak anglers, the jet boaters, like you got to know before you get to the water, like what you're dealing with, just to save you some time and to make sure that, you know, you're not going to get stuck out there in, in horrific conditions. Um, yeah. yeah. Those rivers, dude, they can get gnarly and you just got to be, you got to be safe. The river looked, uh, the Susquehanna River looked terrible. The river looked terrible a couple of days ago. I really? went through up around uh, Lancaster. I crossed over the bridge there. Um, and, um, uh, it was brown and it was angry looking, man. It was high. So. With the money, with the clarity of the water and stuff right now, have you been out a lot? Yeah. I mean, um, I was out a lot before it rained and then I just started going out a few days ago. How was it? Once it came down. What'd you ask? How was it? Um, it hasn't been good for me there because these, these fish are, they're no longer in that area. They're, they're, uh, they're, um, headed to greener pastures, man. Is that because of the, why? Like, is it just because it flooded or is it because it stopped flooding? No. Well, there's, there, there's still fish in that area. It's because of the, uh, um, my belief it's because of the water temperature, uh, for some reason, when the water stays cold like that, you know, under 50 degrees, it's, you know, 45, 46 degrees or lower, they stay out on the main river. They won't pull up into tributaries or anything like that. I don't know why. That's weird. Hmm. I mean, you, could you catch a few in there? Yeah, but but you're not going to catch uh, concentrations of them like you would if uh, the water was warmer. <laughs> What that's, if, that, 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 that's my observation with it. And that's what I, um, I experience when I'm out there. Where do they pull out to? You mean on the river? Yeah. Like, do they just like leave I that whole no section? They're probably, they probably are in, uh, you know, shoreline eddies. But I mean, when the water's that high, it's real hard to fish the main river. Mm. And if it's that high and, um, the water's going to be brown, it's real hard to catch smallmouth in brown water in most certain most situations because i was always interested like do they just leave that whole section of river or do they just pull off and stay in the same section uh you mean in the spring yeah uh they'll they'll, they'll leave uh stretches of river and only you know a handful of fish will probably stay um stay back and they, they spawn there but uh they're they're not the majority with the with the amount of rain that we're getting now, how much do the creeks factor into where you're going to fish? So I'm thinking you got Antietam, you got Goose Creek, you got the Monocacy. I'm trying to think of another big creek. Um, I think those are I think that's all of them. So with those creeks, 
does mm-hmm. that factor into like, okay, it, it rained a lot in Maryland. So that means like the Monocacy will probably be blown out. So that means I should stick to the Virginia side. Like d- does any of that kind of factor into it? Yeah, it does. Um, the, uh, the river, you know, it, it, even if it, even if it rains, if, if, if the um, weather just muddies up the uh, Potomac itself, um, I guess it does depend on where the ra- rain comes from. Like, uh, it can rain in, like, the Shenandoah Valley real hard and make the Shenandoah River push mud, mm. muddy water, and it will affect the rest of the Potomac River down that below makes sense. it. But then you can go up the Potomac River past the Shenandoah, and the water will be clear. I've seen that, too. Interesting. I mean, that, so you just got to keep sense, going yeah. north. And then, and then after the water has done what it's done, and it's gone up real high, after a few days, if you just keep going north, you know, if you're in a boat and you just keep going further and further north, um, eventually, um, within a few days or a couple days, if you just keep venturing out, eventually you'll find where the clear water's starting to um, come down. And that's where fish should be. As we're getting in here and the water starts coming back down, what baits are you generally throwing this time of year? And how do you stay on the fish? Um, I'm throwing plastics, you know, the regular stuff, the Ned rigs, tubes, uh, any small plastic, uh, any type of four inch swim bait, you know, four inch or three inch swim bait. Um, and once the water warms up some, you can catch a few uh, fish right now on spinner baits, but, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say, uh, catching, uh, two fish of a spinner bait all day long is, uh, is a spinner bait bite, <laughs> you know? Mm. So I think, um, once the water warms up and it gets, you know, it, it gets into about the mid fifties and it's not coming down, you know, uh, until next, next winter or next late fall. Um, that's when they'll start hitting spinner baits, chatter baits, um, you can still catch them on uh, jerk baits if the conditions are right. You know, if there's clear water. What about the chatter bait and crank baits? Yeah, all all the same in the same situation as the spinner bait. Whenever the water uh, comes up to about fi- uh, 55 degrees, um, you should at some point be able to find a, a, a real good bite on uh, moving baits. Yeah, because that's really what I'm hoping for is to start seeing here in the next couple of months is that that bite really starts picking up. And definitely that that muddy water. I've seen some guys really smoking them on like chartreuse crankbaits, like uh, the Bandit, the Lucky Craft, mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, if you had to pick, would you rather catch a smallmouth on a single hook, like a, a swim jig, a spinnerbait, a chatterbait, or a treble hook? Probably a, a spinnerbait. I really like spinnerbaits. Uh, I like... Uh, Spinner bait fishing, and I like jerk baits. You know, jerk baits have uh, treble hooks, but um, I really like spinner bait fishing. Uh, but I, I don't feel like um, there isn't always that situation isn't always there. I guess the jerk bait's the same way. So most of the time, I'm fishing. I don't want to, but I fish with plastics because that's the way to catch them. Mm-hmm. But if the uh, conditions call for it, a uh, spinner bait, uh, you can you can just crush them with it. How heavy do you go this time of year when, when the water is really ripping like this? I mean, I'm assuming, are you still throwing like those one eighth ounce heads? No, no, no. Three eighth ounce and a half ounce. Oh, wow. I make the three eighth ounce uh, spinner bait and I make a half ounce spinner bait. And the half ounce would be, um, you know, they have the same blades and stuff on them. It just depends on, um, it's going to depend on how fast the water's moving. If you if you're throwing into real swift water, you'll probably want to throw a uh, um, half ounce with uh, willow leaf blades on it. Yeah, and that's what's so crazy is the the half ounce and even the full ounce spinner bait really hasn't caught on here as much as I I thought it would. But also, I could maybe play the devil advocate that it has caught on, but no one was talking about it, like throwing those super heavy spinner baits when this current. Well, the half happening. ounce, um, you can. You can find compact, uh, like I have for sale. You can find the compact spinner baits. Uh, my half ounce and three eighth ounce spinner bait, they look just like they look the same. Oh, really? The weights under the skirt, yeah. Hmm. The head's the same and everything. 
Yeah. Looks like the identical spinnerbait. That one's just heavier. Yeah. Is it because of the flash you think the spinnerbait works so well for smallmouth? I, it has to be that. I you, think it's the uh, flash and I think it's the the thumping. Ah. It's the thumping. Uh, the vibration that they put off. That pulsing. Yeah. And then you don't just, you don't, if you throw a spinnerbait, you don't just throw it out and reel it in. You want to throw it out and um, get that skirt speed to it up, slow it down, speed, speed it up, slow it down. Maybe um, pop the, uh, rod a couple times make the skirt flare but the second that thing hits the water when you cast it out you want it going immediately you want it you want to get it going immediately so they can't look at so they can't get a good look at it that's something that i actually learned like a long time ago from i think it was uh edwin evers i think that he talked about that like he sometimes will throw his spinner by like a jerk bait and he'll like just snap the rod tip every now and then just mm -hmm. to make that that skirt plume and stop and pulse and i've yeah, had success can... with that you can throw it out, but this, but when you, but for these small mouth, you want to throw that spinner bait out. Once it hits the water, you want it, you want the, you want the blade spinning. You want a spinner bait that the blades will spin on real, real easy. And you want to get it going immediately because mm. you don't want them to look at it. You don't want them to get a good look at it. Cause, um, I think they have really, really good eyesight. Small mouth do. I agree with that. If you ever, if you ever, ever, ever seen a small mouth's eyes, they're really, really detailed, more so than a largemouth. Um, you know, they have different color. You know, they have that with the brown, the orange, the red, a variation of all three. And then they have that gold ring that goes around their eye. Have you ever seen that? Mm -hmm. Notice that? I mean, that's um, it's a very detailed eye. And I think um, movement, flash, uh, and then that um, thumping just really gets them uh, to strike it. There and it, it's interesting, like as we get into like the cleaner water period, just so I can get back into some smallmouth fishing again. I'm kind of missing it. I've been catching too many green ones lately. Um, and you know, by this by the time this episode probably is up on the channel, um, I will have been at Lake Anna because I'm leaving in Lake Anna from in two days from now, and we're going to be chasing largemouth again. And it's funny that I, I live next to the Upper Potomac near the Conica Jig, so I kind of get lonely for the old smallies, and. They are. They're such a visual predator, and it's such an interesting way that you you chase them comparatively to largemouth in general. Where, yeah, when you get the muddy water and stuff, you know you can throw the big spinner baits, things like that. But a lot of times you are dinking and dunking, and you got to kind of outsmart that little guy because they are such a impressive predator when it comes to visualizing their bait. And yeah, I don't think the, I don't think the largemouth move like that on the river. No. I think they just stay put where they are, and they spawn in there because the. Cause um, this is about the time of year where I catch, uh, um, I'll catch real big ones up in creeks. Really big, real big largemouth. Yeah, yeah. I and I suppose they're up there because they're going to spawn. And um, I never, I don't see them any other time of the year, except for in this in the um, spring, about this time of year, and the fall, late fall, maybe in the winter too. How often do you actually so, catch a largemouth? Um, not often. It varies. Uh, a real big one, only a few times a year. And when I say big, I'm talking about over four pounds. Is it more like a unicorn then? Yeah, but I mean, it, it happens um, every year, a couple times throughout the year from, you know, January to December. Uh, someone will hook into a real big one. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty cool though to catch a real big one. Oh, yeah. Dude, I mean, uh, one that's four or five pounds puts puts up a, a pretty good fight. A four or five pounder is a large amount is always, especially if you're not like ready for it. Um, and you're fishing, let's just say your, your Ned rig rod on four or five pound test. And then you get a five pound large amount to come out and smoke it. Uh, it's that's a heck of a treat. And it's just interesting that some yeah. stretches of the river have more of them. Like you said, it's just bizarre. Maybe it has to come down yeah, to the grass. Some of the creeks, I mean, because that's where they're living. Uh, um, I don't ever catch one without a creek within sight you know what i mean i might be 100 yards down river or up river but there's a creek nearby they're always in those creeks and some of these creeks hold more than others hmm. for whatever reason they like them and they don't like others that's so weird i wonder why i don't know i, I have a hard enough time trying to figure out the small mouth <laughs> so do you um, do you think all this rain is going to affect the spawn no 
Now, e even if we got a lot of rain in the middle of the spawn, it's not going to affect it. Uh, they're they're built for this. Now, if it happens back to back to back where we get like um, flood level conditions, you know, 15, 16, 17 feet over and over and over again, like in 2018, then I think, yeah, it could it could affect the uh, how they um, how their spawn is going to be. But if it if it does it a couple of times throughout the spring, um, you know, um, a few weeks apart, uh, it's not going to affect them. I think that's important for people to keep in mind then too. It's like, it really is when you get the rain. That's what's so important. As long as, you know, as long as the weather conditions kind of stabilize right now, then you should be good to go. And they're not going anywhere either. When the water comes up like that and they're spawning, they're going to stay right where they are. And the water comes back down. There they are. Again. If you had to pick three baits then, like gun to your head between now and May, what would your three baits be that you could go out and just always catch a smallmouth? Probably uh, um, a jerk bait. Um, since since we're coming up on, um, you know, we'll be in the middle of June soon, and the wa wa weather's going to warm up. A spinner bait, and for a plastic, it would probably probably be a tube. What kind of jerk bait? Um, brand. Yeah. Probably uh, for the Potomac River, uh, probably a Lucky Craft, mm. and um, it would go Lucky Craft, Rapala, and then Mega Bass. Spinner bait, go. Spinner bait, the one I uh, the one I make. Well, talk about it, dude. This is a great little segue. Yeah, no, the the one I make, the SWFA spinner bait that I make, the three eighth ounce and the uh, uh, half ounce. Um, I like using the. I have a white one. I have, I have a few different colors, but I like white. There's a peanut butter and jelly color that I really like. Um, and I like the, um, uh, uh, green pumpkin color that I have green pumpkin. And, People do not throw yeah, green pumpkin, a green pumpkin color. And then I have, you know, two different, two different types of skirts, one that I actually make. And then one that already comes, uh, it's, it, they're, they're fancier skirts, but, um, the, uh, I think the blades have a lot to do with it. I like the willow leaf blades for clear water and it, it just depends and if, if the water's dirty um to heavily stained i like the uh the uh colorado blades but it just depends on how um how fast the water's moving you can't throw a colorado a double bladed colorado uh spinner bait in real swift water you feel like you're uh dragging something underwater you know what i mean yeah you want to use a uh willow leaf how do you know when to use the right color for that spinner bait? Um, you just have to, you just have to try the, uh, white, what did I say? White green pumpkin. And then that peanut butter and jelly, which is like a Brown, um, purple. It's Brown purple. And, um, I think it's got a little bit of red in it. Maybe. I, yeah. A little bit of red in it. Um, I like using that white one in clear water. I like using it in dirty water. The uh, I like using them all. It, it, it just depends on what you think they're hitting better on, to be honest with you. There's no other way to really explain it. Yeah, I mean, matching the hatch is extremely important. Um, just kind of silly, but just white switching. ones seem to really white ones seem to really work, man. White, it, yeah, they need to write oh, a white and chartreuse. Um, the one that I sell, it's, it's white and I, I completely forgot about that because, uh, cause I just, because I have a white one in a white shark, white and chartreuse is a good, good color, a good, it doesn't matter what the, uh, color of the water is, but that brown and, uh, purplish red color that I have, um, has always seemed to work and, uh, oh, I don't paint the heads of them. Hmm. Because it's it's not even worth worth your time to paint the heads of a spinner bait. Because you know what happens to the paint on the spinner bait, it gets uh, it chips off. Do you ever use painted spinner bait blades? You know what? No, I don't. I'm sure there's a, a a time and a place for them, like the chartreuse colored ones. You mean? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've never even um, I've never really even messed with them. Um, if if I thought that if I could figure out some type of pattern or something like that, I would mess with them. 
Um, sometimes I throw different um, different brand spinner baits just to see what they do. And uh, and I've thrown I've thrown like black blades, uh, the chartreuse colored blades, uh, with um, I don't know gold uh, gold uh, with a gold blade. I always use double blades. That seems to work really well. Not three, four, five blades. I know that kind of gets out. No, of hand. and then the um, and I don't put a trailer on my spinner baits. Hmm. Um, I pu I'll put a trailer hook, but I don't throw a. I don't put a trailer hook, or some people call them stinger hooks. I don't put a trailer hook on the back of a spinner bait unless I have to. I always keep some around just in case, just to be able to like verify yeah. if I start getting a lot of short strikes, what I'm getting short strike by. I guess if it's necessary, yeah, but um, if it's not and they're really grabbing them and um, there's really no need, the, the hooks are real sharp. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you'll see them, though, if the water's clear enough and you're and you're using them, you'll see them swat at the spinnerbait. You ever seen them come up and just flash on a spinnerbait? Yes. Largemouth do it, too, but uh, uh, smallmouth are notorious for it. You'll see a white belly or a bronze color. Just Just swat at it. And, um, have you ever caught one, um, have you ever caught one under the chin on a stinger hook? Yes. That's because they're trying to grab the blades. I've seen, I've seen smallmouth. I've hooked them or thought I hooked them and I brought them all the way back to the boat and they've had the blade in their mouth the entire time and they wouldn't let it go. And once you get to the boat, you spook them. So they let the blade go and they swim away. I've always wondered why more manufacturers don't make a stinger hook that can go onto the blade of a spinner bait or an underspin for that matter. I know you can jerry rig it, but that'd be an interesting th product. And I'd just be curious to see how well it would sell. So if people are- What do you mean? Uh, um, like a trailer hook? A stinger hook that you put on blades. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it would probably disrupt how the blade spins. I saw, um, there's this guy a long time ago. I saw this on Instagram. There's like two winters ago. Guy in the, and I think it was South Carolina. And for his underspins, he like, I think he either soldered or he like welded a little like micro one on one hook on his willow leaf blades on his underspin because the spotted uh -huh. bass would come up every now and then and they'd like whoosh, and grab at the blade. And it was just something he did because every now and then he'd catch a bonus fish. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and they um, and you'll you'll snag them too. You'll hook them in their side with a uh, spinner bait because, like I said, they swat at them. Mm -hmm. When I say swat, they come up and they uh, mm. uh, they bump them. You've seen them do that, right? Where oh, they yeah. bump them. Yeah, yeah. I it I guess obviously that's some some form of aggression. They're uh, I don't know if they're trying to uh, dis disorientate whatever they think it is, so they can come back and strike it again. I don't know. Well, and when they're doing that, that's when I'm going to switch to a crankbait. Um, if they're slapping at it, they, they want to chase mm -hmm. and kill, but they don't want to actually bite it. I like to switch mm -hmm. something with treble hooks. Cause I feel like that's what makes treble hooks shine so freaking well is they don't have to inhale it for you to button them up. And I get this. I wonder lot. why, um, they don't come out with a long shanked, uh, a long shanked, uh, trailer hook for spinner baits. You know what I mean? Oh, they have to. Do they have them? They must somewhere. Guys, in the episode description, let me know if they make a long shank hook when this thing re-uploads. That would be interesting. Yeah, dude, they have to, right? Yeah, like, a, you know, a pretty good size um, um, treble hook, like like you find on on uh, jerk baits, but has a long, uh, I guess you call it the shank of the hook. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would be wicked on the back of a uh, spinner bait. It would make sense, too. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. But yeah, like that's something for people that are, you know, are listening to this. When you go to a, um, I mean, a great example of this is a, with a swim bait or a swim jig. Generally, the bite on a swim jig or a swim bait is it, it's not violent in the sense of that you might be thinking. Because what they do is when they are eating a swim bait or a swim jig, they just come back and they inhale it. And you, it just goes slack. The line goes slack because that's because they ate yeah. the whole thing. Almost like they push it forward, right? Yeah. But if they're smacking yeah. at it and you're like, oh, man, that one took the rod out of my hand. That means he's actually hitting the bait, I think, with his mouth closed. And he's like trying to ram it, but he's not taking mm -hmm. it. And I, I think smallmouth do that a lot. I think smallmouth do that a lot. Yes. I think they nail things. Because have you ever seen them when you catch one and they have a fish head first down their throat? Yeah. How in the world? 
there's no way in the world they're going to catch something, you know, head first like that, unless they're, I, I guess, I mean, they can hide, I guess, real well, but uh, that takes a lot of energy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I would imagine they stun them. I think they stun them. And, but I, and I guess my point is that that's why you got to keep like a treble hook bait and then your regular like one hook bait available, depending on the mood of the fish. Mm hmm. And that's but, why uh, I, I can tell you if you're um if you're throwing a spinner bait in the morning, like uh, coming up here when when I think it's going to be good and um, you're throwing it in areas where you think you should be getting uh, bites um, and you've given it a good 30, 45 minutes. I'd put it down and start fishing with plastics. Yeah. Because you're just going to waste a day throwing a spinner bait. Um, I think they um, sometimes they'll hit them, and then and then here's another thing too: if they're not hitting spinner baits, they might hit a chatter bait. Mm -hmm. You can you can throw in one spot, and they won't hit a spinner bait at all. It doesn't matter which one you throw at them. You change up and throw a chatter bait like those um, uh, Z-Man chatter baits, and they'll uh, they'll nail those. Now those I will throw with a trailer on them. What's your favorite trailer? Just a a, a big uh, like a four inch, uh, uh, some type of swim bait, a Kitex swim bait usually, something that I can cut, you know, to to fit, so that the tail kind of just sticks out from um, behind the skirt. I don't know why um, it matters. I just do it. I guess it's a confidence thing, you know. I feel like the chatter bait is a uh, um, pretty naked without a uh, without a trailer. What's your favorite color chatter bait combo? chatterbait probably a white one white chartreuse colored one you really can't top that can you no um and then the same colors that i'm talking about uh, i also have a black spinnerbait i think um uh you can't overlook black for sh for for a uh chatterbait or a uh, spinnerbait black skirts that is why i think that depending on how dirty the water is i think it um uh they can pick it up better when they go, you know, when they uh, feel like they're going to want to strike it, I guess it, um, it's just easier for them to see in dirty water, just like it is if you use a black plastic. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. That honestly does. It makes a lot of sense. Jeff, I mean, yeah, I can't thank you enough as always um, for coming on to, to really just tell yeah. us about the river right now. Uh, do you have any specials or anything going on with your website that you'd like to, to mention? Um, Right now, let's see here. Hold on. Let me see what I got going on here. I got, um, I think, let me see. Do I still have the, no, those aren't. Hold on. Stay with me here, people. Oh, I have a, uh, right now for sale, I have a Tatula uh, 2500 series um, uh, spinning reel. Oh, wow. Daiwa. I have it on sale right now. So if someone wants to go check that, I have it for $189.99. Um, and uh, I think right now that's – oh, the uh, tubes too, plastic plastic baits. I'm still running a sale on my tubes, $3.50 for a pack of 10, 30% off. So well, as there you go. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Of course, Jeff's number and email is there as well. If you have a question that we didn't cover on the show, you can ask it in the comment section. Uh, we'll get to it. Or just email or give Jeff a call, and uh, he'll be happy oh, to hey, answer. Oh, um, hey, also, for people that are um, out there this spring, um, don't overlook throwing a three-inch Cinco. Yep. Uh, one, once the water, I feel like once the water warms up a little bit more, you know, 55, 60 degrees, uh, a three-inch Cinco. Um, on a, um, what I like to use is a Charlie Brewer slider head on something like that. 16th ounce. The best. I'm telling you, they, they kill it. They, they, they kill it. The slider head dude is a fantastic hook that I need to use a little bit more. I also need to get better with a tickler. You know, I have, I have a friend of mine that always fishes that thing and just smokes them and I refuse to throw it. So that's something that I why, need to why get better you, with. Why aren't you throwing the tickler? I don't like throwing. You tickle them up sometimes, yeah, man. I, it's. Well, it's this, I, if you're fishing a team tournament, I just don't like fishing the same thing as my partner. And it was a great example of this. I was fishing Fountainhead two weeks ago and this guy was fishing these $300 glide baits. And it's like, cool. If you're fishing that, I'm going to fish something else and pick off the ones that don't. Um, so what I need to do 
is go out by myself more with it and actually fish it. That probably would be like the smart. The tickler? Move. Yeah. Throw it on a lightweight, man, like 332nd or a 16th ounce jig head. Hmm. You know? I mean, act like you're fly fishing out there. <laughs> you know? Oh, and also, hey, if uh, people go to my website, they can go to the, the section for um, uh, where you can subscribe to my um, uh, SD, or SWFA Baits fishing journal and the in my little fishing blog if you subscribe to that you get 10 percent off your purchase there you go guys as always link in the episode description to everything that we talked about uh please give this page a like it really helps out in the algorithm also if you want and, to um sorry sorry go ahead go ahead no no, no go for it oh the 10 percent for anything i sell my trips online on my website so people never put two and two together but I've just given up my deep, dark secret. There you go. So you can get 10% off a guy fishing trip with Jeff. A dinner date with Jeff is all 10% off. Yes. So go on and do that. Anything else you got on your website? No, that's it, man. And as always, guys, link, link in the episode description to his website, his guide service, social media handles, everything. Go check that out. Also, go check us out on Patreon. Uh, Katakta and Fishing Garage just came on as a Patreon uh, for the next year. Go check them out. Also, we had permission to do supplemental stocking for Virginia and Maryland. So if you want to help us hit our goal of starting a nonprofit, go check us out. Like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.